I am so excited that Lee Epstein is our speaker for today. Uh, Lee and his wife Ruth are with us, and um, he's going to be speaking to us here in just a few moments. Lee Epstein is one of the co-leaders of the New Heights Church in Fayetteville, along with Jim Hall, and they do a phenomenal job leading that church. I didn't really know Lee until two years ago, but wow, this is a man of God. This guy loves the Lord. This guy has a heart for God. He, uh, his heart is full of compassion like Jesus. This man is full of wisdom. He is a man of prayer. And I have been so blessed every time I've had the opportunity to, to be in a meeting with him, uh, to hear him speak a, a devotional thought, uh, and especially when, when we would talk on the phone, it would be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, this guy has so blessed my life, and I'm excited this morning that I'm going to share that blessing with you. Tim, I promise you, my wife was sitting there thinking, who is this man you're talking about? <laughs> I wish I could have married that guy. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And as you all know, Tim and Becky, they're amazing. They're just such godly, incredible people. Well, and I've been just as blessed to get to know. More so Tim than Becky, but I do know Becky, and it's been a blessing. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that you're going to Alabama, but uh, I'm excited that God's going to do that. The state of Alabama, I'm not a fan of, but where you're going to Alabama, I'm a fan of. So, um, hey, thank you for inviting me to teach. It's always an honor to be here at New Heights Siloam. Let me get this out of the way real quick. Um, my last name is Epstein. I'm a Messianic Jew, born and raised, born in LA, raised in San Diego, California. So every once in a while, I'll sound like Jerry Seinfeld. I do, it just comes out. It really, really does. I'm not making that up. Before I knew who Jerry Seinfeld was, I talk like this. I really, it's crazy. Um, you say, is it Jewish? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I was standing right over there, almost under that, trellis awning type thing five weeks ago, Sunday night, officiating my youngest son, Noah Epstein, who happens to be our youth pastor down, down south, uh, officiating his wedding. And so Ruth and I have incredible memories of this space. And we feel like maybe the Shekinah glory from Sunday morning carried over to Sunday night because it was phenomenal. For the first time in 29 years, um, someone else gave the gospel at my son's wedding besides me giving the gospel at a wedding. And it was my son. My son asked me a month earlier, he said, Dad, can I give the gospel? And I said, you sure you want to do that? And he said, I want to do it. I've been dreaming of this my whole life. And he shared the gospel. And he's, you know, he's a preacher because he said, I'm only going to be three minutes. And 13 minutes later, he was done. So uh, it was uh, an incredible, incredible time. So when Tim asked me to speak on what God has put on my heart lately, a bunch of topics came to my mind. Um, for, a, for a preacher, it's like a buffet, a good buffet. You're like, what do I pick? What do I choose? And if you were to ask my staff, they, they could have answered right away. They would have said, Lee would talk about time. Lee always says that the next greatest revival that will take place is when God's people steward God's time for God's kingdom purposes. It's that, it's that acceptable sin, right? My time is my time. I do what I want with my time. Um, so I, I want to talk about time this morning. Um, I recently read an article that gave me great concern. It was an article about what is destroying family life in America. And it's interesting. And it wasn't written by a Christian. Uh, a, a sociologist. It was incredibly well sourced. It was an article um, that basically said what's destroying family life in America isn't violence. You ready for this? It isn't education or lack thereof. It isn't divorce. Um, it's not, not drugs or infidelity. The article's premise was this, and I want you to see this. People are too busy we live this frantic, soul-depleting pace of life, and it's driving us all crazy. Now, the obvious question is this, why do we do that? 
Nobody plans on, on being burnt out. Nobody graduates from school and says, um, I, I want you to see this as well. I want, I want to sign up. Can we get this on the screen? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I don't have it. That's okay. Um, nobody says, I want to sign up for a life of chronic fatigue and exhaustion and depression. But it happens all the time. Now, I know for some of you, um, this isn't an issue. But for others in this room, you're, you're a little bit like me, and you struggle with this. So here's what, here's what I want to do. Just to make sure that we're not in denial, I want us to take a test together. So do me a favor. Take out um, pens, pencils. Probably don't know what a pencil is anymore, but iPads, iPhones, um, paper. Okay, that's foreign as well. Just take out your phones, okay? Um, and number one through six. Number one through six. You're like, man, oh man, this guy comes up from Fayetteville and we're like in a classroom. What's going on? Numbers one through six. And I want you to be honest about this. We're going to go through an ass assessment area, six of them, and just answer yes or no. Okay? Number one, it should be up on the screen. I often feel like there are not enough hours in, in the day. I feel like I'm playing catch up all the time or more often than I want to. Yes or no? Yes or no? Number two. I find myself sometimes or often looking for ways to multi, multitask. I have this compulsive need to be doing more than one thing at the same time or I get a little nervous. Ruth and I, we just started getting into um, uh, Korean rom-coms on Netflix. Anyone do that? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. You're shaking your head. I know, yes, thank you. Me and the girl to the left. Thank you. All right. In the back, one, one guy, hand this high. And so we, we're watching Korean rom-coms on Netflix, and what, what's the one thing you can't do if you don't speak Korean? You can't look away from your phone. I mean, from the screen. So my phone is sitting there just beckoning me, but if I go to multitask, I, I miss the show. So for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, totally focused, totally focused. So I find myself sometimes or often looking for ways to multitask, yes or no. Number three, I sometimes find myself feeling guilty around time issues. I sometimes feel that I may be cheating my family. Um, I sometimes feel that the kids or the grandkids are growing up too fast and I'm missing it. Or I feel that I ought to be praying, praying more. I want to. I want to, but I seem too busy, yes or no. Number four. The next, this next question involves what experts call magical thinking. That means that you consistently underestimate the amount of time that it will take you to get something done. So it means that you're always in a hurry. Let me give you an example. One time, five years ago, you made it to work in 15 minutes when it usually takes you 20 to 25 minutes. All the lights were green, and you were following the speeding ambulance the whole way there. And every morning since, you plan on making it to work in 15 minutes, even though it has not happened a single time since. Magical thinking. Yes or no? Full disclosure, I said this to Tim this morning. Tim texted me in, in his very nice Tim way. You okay, buddy? Did you go to the wrong building? Where are you? And I said, magical thinking. In my mind, in my mind, Siloam is always 20 minutes away. <laughs> I think I did it once in a helicopter. I don't know. Every time. Number five, procrastination. Do you find yourself putting off going to the doctor or getting your taxes done? And do you get addicted to crises or deadlines all the time? Yes or no? Yes or no? Number six, um, I struggle with impatience. I often have moments when I'm driving, and I'm hoping the person driving um, next to me does not go to New Heights Church. Anyone ever do that? Ruth often will say on a Sunday if we're driving to church together, she said, man, you're going slow. I said, yeah, who knows? I don't want to cut someone off going to New Heights Fayetteville, right? I don't want to do something inappropriate. I don't want to be overly aggressive. Do you size up the speed of the other people sitting in your row of chairs so you know if you can exit faster to your right or to your left? Yes or no? How many of you said yes to at least one of the questions? Raise your hands. 
Okay, good. It's an honest group. Um, we're coming out of denial right now. Do me a favor. Turn to the person next to you and say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm out of control. I, I'm out of control. Listen to this. Jesus has an invitation for us. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is is easy and my burden is light. Doesn't that sound good? Come to me, anybody that's weary, not just in your body, but in your soul, and I'll give you rest. Then he says something that's rather surprising. He says, take my yoke upon you. Doesn't that strike you as something kind of odd to say to tired people? What's a yoke? You're super tired, you're super wore out. The pandemic has got you down, life has got you down, busyness has got you down. What's a yoke? He says, he says take my yoke upon you. A, a yoke um, is an instrument of burden. Burden. He doesn't say take my orthopedic um, mattress or take my lazy boy recliner. That would have been nice. He says, take my yoke, take my, take my instrument of burden. Now, why does he say this? Well, Jesus does this a lot, right? He's the master teacher, and as a master teacher, he often says things where we go, what the? But here's the problem. If you grew up in the church, or you've been around Christianity for, for any amount of time, and even God's word, you sometimes, we sometimes overlook these little things that Jesus says, Let's talk about this yoke for just a moment. This is really important. The word yoke is used over 50 times in the Bible, and almost always it involves a picture of being in submission to someone or something. This is from the prophet Jeremiah. He says, and I quote, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people. This is a picture of submission. The apostle Paul says to the church in Galatia, he says, do not let yourselves be burdened, overwhelmed by a yoke of slavery. Here's the deal about yokes. Everybody wears one. Everybody. Jesus knew this. A yoke is whatever cause or dream or goal you hook your life up to. Whatever you submit your life to. We all submit our lives to something. It might be your job, it might be your marriage, it might be your singleness, it might be what some other people are thinking about you. Anyone submit yourself to what other people are thinking about you? How's that working out? And get this, every single yoke besides Jesus' yoke turns into a form of slavery. A bondage. Ultimately, it'll crush us. And so Jesus says, take my yoke on you. Let's define my yoke, my way of life on you. If you trust me with your time, you will find rest for your souls. In 2,000 years, almost, Jesus has never led anyone into exhaustion or discouragement. You say, well, <laughs> I know some pastors. It's not Jesus. Let me tell you, the church can burn. I know some missionaries. Not Jesus. Mark Hansen is on the radio 24 hours a day. That poor guy never leaves the station. <laughs> not Jesus and a recording. Hallelujah. <laughs> not Jesus. He really does have an answer to the insanity that is around us. There really is another way. But we have to admit that we're out of control and we need to get serious about turning our time over to him. And that's what I, I want to look at this morning. So for the rest of our message, here's what I want to do. 
Here's what I want to do. I want to talk about three lessons. They all come from nature. But they, but they teach us what we need to do if we're going to turn our time over to God and our trust over to God. Because to turn our time over to God means we turn our trust over to God. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So um, the first one is what we might call the, the lesson of the birds. The lesson of the birds. Um, do me a favor. If you haven't already, turn in your Bibles or your Bible devices. You don't want to trust me, right? Or even the screen. Um, to Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus is speaking. Theologians would say it's the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 25, and Jesus said, Therefore, I tell you, do not um, worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It, it's, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? The lesson of the birds is this, and I'll sum it up for you. You can see it behind me. Give up the illusion that we are in control of anything. So, personal confession. Um, last year, March 12th, 2020, anyone, anyone remember that day? Isn't it interesting? You're, you can get close to it, right? It was the Friday before, for us, the first Sunday that we canceled church. We weren't quite sure what this pandemic was. We're getting all sorts of different information. We just, you know, it was leaking out in bits and pieces, and... Uh, and Ruth and I were just a little clueless, not super tied into social media, trying to get caught up in that, um, not healthy for us. And so I'm just really not sure. And we said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go down. I had Sunday off, so to speak. I wasn't teaching. I had no responsibility at church. We're going to go um, buy some chili fixings at, at Walmart, make chili on Friday, and then drive down to Texas. My mom lives outside of Dallas. Give her some chili. She had some things that she needed us to do, help her out. And it'll be really cool. It'll be fun just to get away. So we pull over the Walmart parking, parking lot, and immediately it's like, it felt like Christmas Eve, right? All those men running at the last second to buy candles for their wives because they didn't know what to buy or whatever, stocking stuffers for their wives. Uh, it looked like the zombie apocalypse. I'm not kidding. As we got closer and closer to the door, people were running, scurrying about. Um, <clears throat> and I had thought to myself during this whole pandemic, that's not going to be me. That's not who I am. I trust Jesus. I'm, I'm like the birds, man. I trust you. I totally trust you, Jesus. Got to the door. Immediately as we walked in, it was pure chaos in Walmart. People were grabbing carts, scurrying, running. And I went from, I'm not going to be that guy, to I grabbed a cart, and this isn't a pretty sight, in my fifth, then 55-year-old body, I ran as fast as I could from aisle to aisle, Ruth in tow behind me, literally pulling off Campbell's soup, pulling off pasta, what, what little was left. Here's the funny thing. I just got to share this. Um, produce section, totally untouched. No lie. No lie. Like asparagus is like, please eat me. No, no, no. We don't want that. Where's the candy? I need candy. And so I'm buying things that I haven't, I mean, I am putting things in my cart that I haven't eaten in 20 years. No lie. I, I, I went to the hamburger helper aisle, pulled off the last seven hamburger helpers. I haven't eaten hamburger helper in 20 plus years. Threw it in the cart. Then it hit me. One word, ramen, ramen. So I am running <laughs> with the cart. And I get to the aisle, the international aisle. I'm here and the, there's another woman at the very end. It's just us two. It's like, the, it's like a gunfight. She sees the ramen, I see the ramen, I run, I beat her to the ramen, I'm not joking, I take the last, with the sweep of my arms, the last 20 bags of pork ramen, throw it into my cart, I look at her and I go, in your face! No, I didn't quite do that, but <laughs> Ruth, I'm not kidding, she catches up to me, she says, Lee, 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 what are you doing? And I, and I, I looked at her and I said these words, I'm so embarrassed, and I screamed at her. And I said, hey, hey, you remember this moment and you'll thank me later. <laughs> Jesus says, stop living as if you have to look out for yourself. 
because nobody else is looking out for you. Someone is watching out for you. God. God. That's the lesson of the birds. Jesus says, look at the birds. They don't sow or reap. In other words, they have very limited time management skills. Birds are not very employable. They're not very ambitious. But, but almost never do you see a bird with real high blood pressure or colitis or obsessing over how the NASDAQ is doing. They're just kind of, they just kind of trust that when they need a worm, there's a worm. When they need a berry, there's a berry. When they need a bird feeder, they devour ours. Man, those birds are nailing our bird feeder. But it's there. It's there. Jesus says when that happens, it's, it's no accident. Why? Because he says this, your heavenly Father feeds them. That's what's going on all the time. Jesus would look at birds and it would make him think about how good God is. Did you ever do that? God never gets tired of taking care of those little creatures. They don't sow, they don't reap. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing to sow and reap. It's not a bad thing to work hard at your career, but I'm telling you, do not make the mistake of thinking that that is where your security lies. A few weeks ago, a young man called me. Um, as you get older, everyone's young, but I, I think he's 34 now. And I discipled him 13 years ago. Still goes to the New Heights Church in Fayetteville. And uh, I hadn't seen him as much, but he, I see him. He now married two kids. And he said, Lee, I, I need to meet with you. And he was, his voice was very solemn. I thought to myself, okay, okay. I knew a bunch of his friends. I don't have time to unpack all this. I don't, I'm not trying to minimize this. Please don't, don't hear that. But some of his friends had kind of been leaving the faith or in the process of deconstructing their faith. Between um, politics and election, a pandemic, um, societal unrest, and oh, by the way, um, I put my faith in mom and dad's faith and not my own faith. Between all those factors in the last two years, year and a half, um, we see people deconstructing saying, yeah, Jesus, I don't think so. I thought, here we go again. He's going to be deconstructing. 13 years ago, this guy on fire for Jesus, being discipled, discipling others, um, mission trips. When he graduated, thought he was going to be a full-time missionary. It doesn't make you better than anyone else, but super passionate for God. Shared his faith constantly. Brought everyone to his community group. Homeless people. Unbelie unbelievable guy. So I said, man, are you deconstructing? And he said this, and I wrote it down. Lee, I'm not deconstructing. I'm drifting. I'm just drifting. He said, I'm, I'm really, and I, I knew this about, I'm a really smart guy. I'm really, really, really good at my job. He, he wasn't bragging, as he is. I work all the time. He said this, I'm just caught up in the things I told myself I would never be caught up in. Not, not sinful things, just neutral, busy things. We live in a part of the world that's full of people who are really good at sowing and reaping and toiling and spinning. Then one day a pandemic hits or the market collapses, or their heart collapses, or their marriage collapses, or a child grows up and they realize they had one shot, one shot at being a mom and dad, and they blew it, and they can't get it back. Or a soul gets cold and small, and self-centered and doesn't even know it anymore. All they're left, all they're left with is a lifetime of toiling and spinning that is real impressive and applauded and successful but empty. They're really, really good at digging for worms. Sow and reap, Jesus says, but don't let it be your yoke. 
Don't go through life with it. And, and if it's getting in the way of what really matters, if it keeps you from praying, if it puts hurt in your family, if, if it's an excuse to keep you from serving, if it's making your heart grow small, if it keeps you up nights worrying, then it's time to take a lesson from the birds. It's time to make some very hard decisions that will take work off the throne of your life. It's time for you to decide this day what yoke you're going to wear because everybody wears a yoke. First, there's the lesson of the birds. Next, there is the lesson of the dust. This is from Psalm 103. Um, Psalm 103 and verse Verse 10, the psalmist says, he, God, does not treat us as our sins deserve. Can I get a hallelujah for that? Amen? Amen? He said, often we're like, God, go get that person. Just not me. That's funny. That's a whole other message. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Oh, thank you, God. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. That's important. As far as from the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, now get this. For he knows how how we are formed. He knows us. He remembers. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. They're dust. We're just dust. The lesson of the dust is this. Write this down. We're not perfect. One of the primary reasons we live such crazy, frenzied lives is we're trying to convince other people that we are healthier and stronger and smarter and more spiritual than we really are. Right? Right? Parents go crazy with their kids because our society says that if you're going to be a good parent, you've got to sign them up for every activity under the sun. And guess what happens? It exhausts the kids and it exhausts the parents. Again, being in a college town, being an old youth pastor, I've sat with so many kids, junior high, high school, college students, young professionals. They're like, that wasn't my thing. K karate, dance, archery, travel team. I was wore out. You know what I wanted? Just mom and dad. Mom and dad were doing it for mom and dad or doing it for the friends. The lesson of the dust is this. God knows I'm not perfect. God knows all about me and offers to love and forgive me anyway. Therefore, I will not waste one more minute of my life, of, of my life living up to anybody else's expectation, expectations of me. I'm just a dust bunny. James puts it this way. Anytime you get really excited about how amazing you are, James is like, hey, you know what you are? Yeah, what am I? You're a flower, really. And then you grow up, whoo, you're so beautiful, yeah, and then you die. Pedal by pedal, boop, 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 just dead. I'm a man, you're dead. Now, it doesn't lessen God's view of you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. He thinks a whole lot about you. He doesn't, doesn't think more about you than he thinks about his glory. And his ultimate purpose and plan for your life. You're not that important that you trump what he has in store for you. So, I want you to practice not being perfect. Say this with me three times. It's liturgy for our culture. Ready? One, two, three. Good enough is perfect. Good enough is perfect. Good enough is perfect. Now, you perfectionists, you're like, no, no, no. Perfect is perfect. No, no. Good enough is perfect. And for some of you, you literally can't stop dusting. So here's some advice. This week, write the word joy in the dust on your living room table. And remember, as one person said, I want you to see this. This is really important. It, I don't know if we have this quote or not, but we do. Dusting is only a process of small particle rearrangement. That's all it is. I feel so good. I'm dusting. They're like, particles are going, oh, let's go sit over here. The problem of trying to look perfect gets deeply into what Jesus is really talking about. In Jesus' day, the rabbis would use the term yoke. They would often use it to refer to the yoke of the Torah, the first five books of the law, the yoke of the commandments. And they would invite their followers to take the yoke of the law on them. And Jesus says this very striking thing because all these people around him are getting exhausted and discouraged, and they're wondering, how will I ever please God? I can't. 
I can't measure up. So Jesus says, take my yoke because it's easy. It's easy. It's not about you being perfect anymore. Newsflash, you never were. I already did that. I sealed your possibility for perfection on the cross. That's it. That's it. I died to pay for your sin, so get this, you wouldn't have to wear the burden, the yoke of your sin. Do you you understand what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I'll take your yoke, the yoke of your fallenness, your brokenness, your imperfections. I'll take that yoke, and I'll give you a yoke that will lead to life. That's the lesson of the dust. I'm not perfect. I don't have to be. One one more lesson, last lesson this morning, is the lesson of, of the grass. The psalmist put it this way, Psalm 90. Most likely Moses wrote this psalm. I find it interesting. He says, yet, verse 5, you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and, and withered. The lesson of the grass is this. Life is unspeakably precious and time is unbelievably short. Therefore, If I'm ever going to live the life God wants me to live, it better be now. It better be now. As surely as we sit in this room, one day each one of us will be swept away in the sleep of death. So Moses says this in verse 12. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So we have some days to number. Moses said if we're smart, if we're wise, we'll take... Taking each day is, is, really, is really, really important. And here's what's key. Nobody knows how many. But we must choose. Like not our boss, not our corporation, not our spouse, not our kids, not our parents, not our peers, not our church, not social media. Do you understand the gift that we've been given? We number the days of our lives. <clears throat> Nobody else does that. Not even God. God's like, I'll let you do it. Isn't it funny? Most of the time, we're trying to throw off God. Let me be me. And then when things get really rough, you're like, God, why didn't you, you know, I don't know, jump in and make me like a robot? God's like, I'm not going to do that. Here's my gift to you. You got at least one day or at least a portion of a day. Be wise with it. Manage it well. We live with this insane idea that the idiotic way in which we live is somehow the fault of somebody else, or that time is going to come along and magically solve all things for us, yet we're given this day. We didn't earn it. We can't control it. It's a gift, and we will decide how we're going to live this day. Maybe you're here with somebody that you love right now. You have this day. This moment right now to love them. So maybe you might want to reach over and put a hand on that person's shoulder or their knee and give them a little squeeze. If you don't know that person, don't do that because they'll have all sorts of issues right now. Some guy's like, I've been waiting for this for years. No, 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 no. If you don't know them or you're not blood related um, or you're not at the very least engaged, no touchy, okay? None of that. Right now. You got this moment. Maybe you just want to reach over and squeeze their hand. Maybe it's time for you to make some changes. I don't know how to say this more seriously. Just be really open with God right now. I heard a story um, about a dad who had a job he loved. He loved this this job. It's a true story. Um, He was on a plane a lot, lot, mostly gone from home. Really exciting stuff, exciting job. And uh, he was gone so much that one day at school, um, his son was at school, the teacher said to him, said, what is your, what is your, where does your dad work? And the little boy said, "Um, up there. And the teacher had to ask the mom's boy, she said, hey, did your husband pass away? 
And uh, this is what your son said. She said, oh, no, no, he's, he's just on a plane a lot. But that's where his son thought his dad was, just up there, not present here. And so this dad quit his job. True story. He gave him a lot of money and excitement and changed his whole life so that when that last day comes, which it surely will, by the way, uh, he would not have a mountain of regrets. As we finish this morning, let me just say this. Some of you are wearing the wrong yoke. And you've wore it for so long, it feels like the right yoke. That's what addiction does. That's what burdens do. They become like a friend. And really, they're an all-consuming enemy, but it feels like a buddy. You have this one life. It's all you get. Moses says you have this one day. That may be all you get. Others have come before you. Others will come after you. This is your day, our day. And God needs a community that will provide an alternate way of life. Because God knows that we live in a place where people live a certifiably insane way of life. Be different. Work differently, act differently, speak differently, love differently. Be present with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. So here's your assignment between now and next week. Take 10 minutes and do a time audit. Do it with your spouse if you're married. Do it with a friend if you're single. Do it between you and God. Ask yourself these two questions. Um, am I numbering my days well? Just be honest about that. Ask someone. Ask someone. When I was um, a relatively new youth pastor coming out of seminary in Greenville, Texas, it's a weird thing when you go from, for me, I had come from the business world working for DuPont, then went to graduate school a little bit later, and then all of a sudden, and we had always been heavily involved in the church, Ruth and I, loved it, did it for free. And all of a sudden, you start to get paid. There's a weird thing that clicks, right? Now, they didn't pay me very much. I think it was like $25,000 a year. But hey, you're like, something clicks. And you're like, I better earn my keep. And so I, I easily was working 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday prayer breakfast, Wednesday night, Friday football, lock in, boom, boom, boom. Had um, two little boys. I think just Levi at the time. Was Noah born yet? He was. Two little boys. And if I would have said to Ruth, hey, am I number in my days well? She would say this, if it wasn't for Jesus, I would have left you. She said that to me. She tattled to two pastor friends of mine who rebuked me. Thank you, Jesus, for a wife who cares enough to tattle on her husband. <laughs> right? How do I practically number my days better Write specifics. Let me give you a head start on this one. I'm a notorious to-do list person. I, I had to become a notorious to-don't list person. Write the things you don't need to do. Everything seems crazy important. If your screen on your phone comes up and it says, hey, dude, you spent 33 hours on your phone this week, which doesn't it do that every week? For some reason, it does that on mine. Um... Be honest. Go, what the heck? What am I doing? I know so many people who say, you know, Lee, someday I'll immerse myself in Scripture. Someday I'm going to activate um, a deep prayer life. I'll learn to Sabbath. I'll learn to be still. I'll get into community. Someday I'm going to really develop my spiritual gifts. Yeah, I know God gave me a gift or two or three, but I'm busy. Someday. And the last day comes, and they never did it. I could count on my fingers and toes and beyond, mainly men who've said to me in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, Someday. So, take 10 minutes this week. Some of you are thinking, Lee, 10, 10 minutes, that's not much time. Let me tell you something, 10 minutes can change your life. 
but you've got to do it. Stop blaming your boss, your wife, your husband, your phone. Stop it. Stop it. You've got to evaluate, ask someone else to evaluate, and say, God, I'm going to change. Uh, uh, good story, really c- cool story. Another young man came to me last Sunday. Um, another young man, a disciple. Uh, he, he too is in his 30s, two kids, and uh, really, really good at what he does. And he said, Lee, um, I need some wisdom. I'm thinking about um, going to part-time at my job. I can be a consultant part-time from my house. And uh, I, I want to do a couple of other things that I think are more kingdom-minded and a couple of other things I can make a little bit of money. And I said to him, I said, whoa, whoa, you have climbed fast. Like, this guy's a hitter, future VP, president of a very large company in NWA. I believe it. He said, yeah, I know. I can't do this anymore. I said, well, I know your wife is a counselor. How sh- is she working? She doesn't. She's staying at home with the kids. We're going to take a 50, 60% pay cut. We don't care. Can- Will you just pray with me? And I was like, oh, no, don't do that. Please tithe. Wait a second. <laughs> ah, uh, be careful what you preach, Lee. I didn't say that. And we're going to have some good discussions, him and me, and what it means to be present and to serve his king and to be a dad and a husband and a servant. you got to do it, though. You must decide that there really is another yoke, a better yoke. And for some of you, you've got a family or kids or a marriage or a soul that's riding on this one. That's the assignment for all of us. Jesus said, I I didn't say this. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Boy, if it's a, if it's a, a gift from Jesus, I, I assume it's really good. Take my yoke and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my, my burden is light. Let me pray. Father, this is a hard one for us um, because we're able, because we live in a culture that allows us to do this, because most of us in this room have been trained to do this. Um, We equate busyness um, with achievement, maybe even with godliness in some ways, and God, help us to be busy for kingdom things and for your sake and your glory. Help us to lay down our our yokes of performance um, and doing and movement for the sake of movement. And help us to take up the yoke of Jesus that's light and beautiful and refreshing and peaceful. God, I do pray for a revival in this room of people who are struggling in this area. Some aren't. Praise God. Encourage them in this. And may they disciple others to take on the yoke of Jesus. But for those who are, I pray, Father God, for repentance. Um, I pray for hard decisions to be made. And then I pray, God, that you would provide as you provide for the birds. Because we're dust. (laughs) We won't be here long. We're grass. We grow up and then we die. So for the time you've given us, starting with each individual day, help us to be wise and make decisions that are pleasing to you and further your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.